So we have reached the end of uh, uh, the WIM conference. Uh, I hope uh, this has been a good experience and thank you for all stay uh, for, for saying for the whole day. And actually, I, I chaired a couple of sessions and I found it difficult to stop people asking questions. <laughs> and that's a good sign. Uh, it, it was, I really enjoyed uh, all the sessions and it, it was very vibrant. So thank you very much for your participation. But that's the idea behind the network. We are a network of professionals and we try to cover all the areas. Uh, so as Tony said, the vision is that it is a vibrant network and we give the uh, excellent, from the point of view of informatics and digital health, uh, from industry, NHS, uh, academia, and hopefully the citizens soon. So uh, uh, we have already some patient advocates as part of the network, so that's very good. We need to do more to include the citizens. So I have a few concluding remarks which I have prepared earlier, uh, but there are generic remarks based on, I think, what we have on our abstract talk and the discussions we had today. So we had very uh, good keynotes, a lot of good invited speeches, but also research from academia and also showcases from industry that uh, uh, show how, how well we do in West Midlands. Um, and I wanted to start with uh, the ideal world. Actually, if we look at the government digital strategy and you look at the objectives and the ambitions about uh, uh, digital engagement, which will include digital health, in particular, if you look at how the digital strategy fits within the Department of Health of the ambitions, we see the interesting topics we have discussed across. So, uh, information. I think Alex started with integrated healthcare uh, uh, achievement through the power of information. And he talked a lot about the hospital electronic health care records. <clears throat> and we have in various sessions discussed about how healthcare records work in the various levels of care. And, uh, but it is the interesting point that uh, this will improve care services and inform research. So bringing together all these elements and measure quality. Of course, the idea is that digital will enable us to have a transparent uh, culture. Uh, uh, again, uh, from the government point of view, they want to see the evidence-based information about services and the quality of care available. Okay, but again, what they have put in the strategy they want is that we support the health and care professionals, and by that they probably imply the patient by giving them more information and have a more information-led culture. Uh, so again, we, we're discussing it from a different perspective as part of the network here, so that's very interesting. And the adoption of digital technology, I like what Tom said. I think patients will be interested, not in analog health, but maybe in digital health in the future. And of course, technology is not the panacea, the panacea for everything, but it's a strong enabler. And uh, this is very, very interesting. And finally, what they look from their perspective is to build on innovation and have integrated solutions and allow people to make decisions, not in a centralized fashion, but in a, in a distributed, localized fashion, so that patients are empowered. So this is what the government said, and this is part of the strategy. Uh, but what is really happening? And I think this is where I wanted to uh, say a couple of things about what we are doing, uh, what was the motivation behind we, what is the motivation behind the digital revolution, which is empowering the patient. And actually, if we look at it from the healthcare perspective, it is where, uh, and, and the citizen perspective, it is where the various bits of the puzzle come together. At the moment, a little bit siloed, a little bit kind of uh, 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 fragmented. But this is again what Tony has identified and Alec in, in, in his morning uh, presentation, and I have seen it in most of the presentations, is the main information, the, ma the main motivation behind 
the concept of health informatics, because we are a health informatics network, is to support the enhanced integrated care approach. And we use the informatics tools and the technology to do that support. But within that pathway, we have the key players, which is academia, industry, the NHS, and the citizens. So based on that kind of empowerment, of course, uh, it has been mentioned that in the world we already try to bring the power of information to integrate uh, the care approach. And that's an example of what is happening in the world. And uh, technologically, groups like HIMSS and the Health Information Exchange, which is an international effort, it has been a little bit American-led, but of course the European Federation of Medical Informatics and very, very strong key groups, especially from primary care, uh, where the inform informatics approach is very important, have been uh, instrumental in putting the patient-centric approach to the delivery of healthcare, bringing all the stakeholders together. And again, that's probably a vision we have, not, uh, of course, the particular stakeholders there, but the vision we have in the HSN. And I think the vision we have uh, also within this network. So, uh, and that's our challenge. And most of the time, we still have a few technical challenges like full interoperability and integration, but also we have social technical challenges, convincing the stakeholders to sit together and deliver that particular vision. So I hope that our network goes towards that, that direction. So I think these are some, some thoughts that I have been having, and I think, although I, I gave them there as a generic set of pointers, I have heard these same pointers in most presentations today and in most discussions. So at the end of the day, the digital revolution in healthcare through the use of uh, digital technology and informatics can be transformative in different ways. First of all, by bringing data together for care and research, we can provide insights to the whole pathway. So the concepts of integration into interoperability are very transformative in that way. And if we want to go to a personalized patient pathway by having more information and make it integrate and interoperate, not only technically, but also in terms of meaning, semantics, then we will be able to understand this better. Of course, we need to understand the complexity of disease and I call this open access quality data and I don't mean open access data with that, I mean open access quality data across the healthcare sector. Okay? And this allows us to build the appropriate evidence. Uh, so, uh, of course, we need to understand the challenges of information governance and how this data can be made open access, but through appropriate uh, uh, work we, we will be able to do that. And at the end of the day, all of this should be targeting the patient, actually making the patient very powerful as a citizen, the patient that understands knowledge behind what is happening for their well-being and health care. And involving the patient into their own management. So we have seen in some sections the concept of self-management, also the concept of decision support, both on the level of clinicians, but also in, in the level of interaction between clinicians and patients. So this will make things very, very different. And as digital community, we allow the citizen and the patients to make the better choices. I was in the se session where the, one of the invited talks was about the patient opinion work that is happening at the, uh, at the moment, where patients have a, a route to put their opinion about the experiences they have within the NHS, and also supporting them making the right choices. Even the NHS, through the NHS choices approach, tries to empower patients uh, in that sense. And, uh, uh, of course, to, to make uh, uh, appropriate effective contact within the service and make the patient experience appropriate uh, through the use of technology and be able to not clog the system 
by sending everybody to a and &E, but using telecare and telehealth services or other approaches in the whole process, we need to do this in an efficient and uh, efficient, cost-efficient way. Uh, but also, as Tommy said, allowing us to not only save money, but create new wealth in that sense. So these are some thoughts which I think cover probably my perspective of what we have done in this network and what we are doing within the HSM. Of, uh, but I'm open for discussion for this. And well, where do we go next? Uh, what are the challenges ahead? And this is a personal view, so I apologize if uh, my views are a little bit controversial. Uh, I hope not too much, but they are under the same type of theme. Well, integration of clinical data sets is essential. All of you, this morning there was a big debate. Why don't we link primary care to acute to secondary care and later on to community and social care? If we want to do that, this is one of the biggest challenges. And that integration is not necessarily technical. It's a social technical and we need to understand it. Of course, we don't need to do this outside of the context of what is happening in the healthcare system across the globe. So it is important to understand the international context, and in particular, the efforts to standardize some of these efforts of interoperability integration. So the uh, uh, IHE, which is the uh, Integrated Healthcare Enterprise, HL7, CDISC, the variety of standard bodies try to resolve these problems of how you empower the clinician and how you make the patient centric to this information driven world. And as we said, as I said, patient centric. So we need to move from the various types of recordings and data to a universal patient healthcare record. And patients should be engaged. They should have access to records beyond the general practice. And I'm saying that because I have access to my record, and I always make my GP very unhappy because he says, you're a very educated patient, Theo, and you have read the nice guidelines, and you make my life a misery. Um, but as the end, he says, he's very happy to negotiate with me because he knows that I will not be a nuisance, and I will listen to him because I negotiated uh, this, uh, this approach. And I think it is important to interpret digitally that information. We talked that we can capture it digitally, but we need to interpret it. Uh, and as I said before, it is essential that we bring closer research and care. They seem to be silent, they seem to be separate. Research brings the evidence that supports care. And uh, digital technologies and data-driven approaches, as Tony said, is, is at the center of that. Um, we, uh, 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 I think Alec uh, and, and Tony and others have talked about the empowerment of the professionals as well as the empowerment of the patient. So we have been talking about shared care, but have we implemented it really? We, have, we can create a universal maybe online or digital approach, but we need to go forward on that. And the electronic transactions need to become broadly available to everybody relating to healthcare. So you trust your banking systems, you trust your e-commerce systems, they're extremely successful. Why are we so difficult about uh, transactions in the healthcare sector? Uh, and the future planning is a planning of co-production is a plan where we are all stakeholders are involved. So having patients not simply giving feedback, but there are educated patients, painful as I am, who can uh, shape the future planning of the digital healthcare landscape. Because as Tony said, most of us, we are citizens and patients, and we're, we like to, to be able to plan it, not as professionals, but also as citizens and patients. And as I, I think as a, as a uh, uh, network, we need to support health informatics innovation. I hope this conference has started trying to do that. And I hope with the help of the HSM, we support it across our themes, in particular with the digital theme. And we had discussions as part of the various sessions today about 
they're all of the new professionals, um, or even they're all of the old professionals that may change in the future. So maybe the doctors of the future will be trained slightly different. They will have a skill set and the force might be slightly different. You see that if any of you are involved in medical education or nursing education, you will be surprised how different they are. I was fortunate to teach medical informatics to medical students since 95, uh, and I've seen the students of 2014. They're very different. They are more inquisitive. The digital technology is more natural to them, and they want to do more. So I think this is very, very important. So these are my future challenges. Um, so looking into the future, I think as a network, this is an opportunity. And uh, maybe before I give my final slide, this is an opportunity to open it to the floor and see what you think about the future. So I'm going to stop for a minute and I was wondering if anybody would like to comment on what I was learning about or anything. Um, I'd just like to say again, you know, I agree with you because um, uh, I'm going to later on uh, after this the Federation meeting and primary care is just as fragmented as how you uh, described it and it is all waiting for the election and um, my daughter is an F2 and I'm married to a GP and you can see the difference because it's, you know, um, the new youth today, they'd like to go to Canada, um, uh, what you call um, Australia. So we're not retaining the United Kingdom doctors that we've trained because of so much, you know, bureaucracy and there's no um, future that they see. So, like I said, what you just described, and technology is the forward thinking, but um, it, it's going to go full circle, right? It's the culture we have to change. Any other views? Yes. I know it's late, but I try to do it interactive and I'm failing. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah? Yes? Uh, yeah, it's more of a comment, really. You talked about data integration between primary and secondary uh, uh, health sectors, but also the care sector as well. Um, and you made the point that this wasn't just a matter of data, there's issues around the way in which we've operated for years and professional boundaries, all this uh, kind of stuff. Um, but one thing I've been pleased about today is the fact that, generally speaking, correct me if I'm wrong, um, when people have talked about integration, they have also been thinking about uh, social care. Whereas um, previously, I think people have tended to think uh, primary, secondary health care. Um, which, of course, and when you embrace or try to embrace social care, it just adds another lot of challenges uh, which we have to overcome. I don't know if you've got a, an optimistic scenario on that that you can uh, feed us with uh, to encourage us as we make our way home after. <laughs> okay, I could give you an optimistic scenario from a European project. Uh, so in Europe, we, we have a large project called Transform, which is translational research uh, and patient safety uh, in Europe. The Transform project tries to support clinical trials. But as part of the use cases, some of the data comes from other aspects outside the uh, clinical uh, care sector. I have to say, and I have to be honest, that we haven't managed to do the technical integration, but as part of the thinking and evaluation, we're asking the questions how to bring that information within this type of research. And the Sun of Transform, which is a project that we submitted as a follow-up of this, we don't know if it's going to be successful, is about GP decision-making where different forms of care information comes in, including social care, including uh, community care. Now in Transform, what we have done is as part of the randomized controlled trials, we gave power to the patient. So we did patient-reported outcome measures, which are not simply allowing the patient to report things, but we involve them in the intervention. And as part of the intervention, although they might use a structured way, we have a web-based, uh, smartphone-based questionnaire and diary for them, they participate in the intervention in that way. So it's not exactly social care, but it's, it's for the first time we started thinking slightly different 
is not only the GP-centric world, although our coordinator is a very enthusiastic GP, but he's also a visionary GP. He says, well, I have a lot of information in my record. I don't use it enough myself, but there is a lot of other information I can draw in. So I hope that that's what we can see in the future. The only other comment I would say, I, I think what I have seen also today is the socio-technical uh, theme. We, we have been thinking about human factors uh, and it's not about the data only, it's not about the healthcare enterprise as a service, NHS, uh, uh, or the existing procedures. We are starting thinking how to look at the barriers and overcome some of the barriers that they are uh, stopping us, but also preserve the processes and the rigor we have. Interesting theme. I, I think it's uh, the uh, harmonization of care generally, you know, and, and it's really a on social and uh, also healthcare. And um, right the way through, people are still talking about patients' healthcare records or electronic. Um, I mean, is, is that very too radical a step to be start uh, thinking about an integrated care record? Well, uh, again, I'll go back to Europe. Uh, we have examples in Europe where they stopped, they stopped calling even patient healthcare records, they call them personal healthcare records. The Antelope project is an, an interoperability integration convergence project where they allow the patients to, well, they, they reach the integrated care pathway by linking what traditionally they call the medical record, which might be hospital based, the patient record, which might be GP based to things that come from the patients. And that's the first step uh, of moving forward. Uh, and I don't think it's, I hope it's not rhetoric, I hope it's not just hot air of words, but the environment of patient uh, can be uh, achieved, and I think it can be achieved now with the uh, possibility for the citizen to be involved through technology which maybe before was not possible because of the silos, well, not the silos, but maybe the barriers we had in the way we were keeping the information and communicating with information. Uh, so, yeah, maybe it is a scary step. And uh, for countries which have a centralised national health service, uh, it might be difficult for the citizen to understand that power and understand that flexibility. For countries which have mixed systems, this is more natural. My home country, Greece, has the same national healthcare system as the UK one. It's the same model, because actually it was the UK NHS that we adopted in Greece. But Greece has a, a free private sector and free insurance-based sector uh, care. And Greece has the, the, the opportunity to go in both systems. And they are more educated, they demand more, more information, they get more involved in their management of the care to the point that they are running the uh, clinicians. And probably that's my heritage, I do the same. Right so, but it helps, it's natural to them. So it might not be impossible in the future. Um, thank you very much for your talk, it was really interesting. Now, for me, the future is human spaceflight because I sit on the board for the UK Space Agency. And I'm wondering whether you are collaborating with uh, the private sector in terms of space and also in terms of military organisations who've already far ahead in terms of telemedical application. I've seen a lot of duplicity today um, of different innovations that already happened and is quite far ahead in those sectors. You brought a, a, a very interesting point uh, that again. Uh, I don't know, is it the healthcare sector that is risk averse? But the private industry has done quite a lot of physiological related work in other domains defense, uh, you know, space, uh, transportation. We see these things now becoming more important. I think we need to, to open the space for that. Maybe the barrier is this, the fear about, well, the funding, but also the fear about. The way, well, or maybe the information governance is the excuse because fear is about but really not. I mean, digitalization is something that uh, the European Space Agency is supporting at the moment. 
and it's maybe some, somewhere where you can get funding because the ELLIPS program is actually offering funding to organisations like yourself. But that's great because I think, I think even you see the research councils, traditional research councils like the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, were very interested in the basic science research of physics and computing. And, but now they are happy to look at the application areas of healthcare. And they buddy with the MRC to do research on healthcare technology that supports clinical research or clinical practice. You see that in the NIHR, they talk to the PSRC, they talk to the other agencies. The European Union has been, funding has been always more progressive in that. And of course, the MOD funding and you know, what they do on supporting the healthcare within the, the, the armed forces is also advanced uh, in, in that sense. Any more comments? Okay, I don't want to keep you any more from our final bit of networking with a bit of wine and legals, I think, Sarah has organized. But I would like to close with a slide that comes from our digital uh, health theme as part of the HSN and probably summarizes what I have said as concluding remarks, but also what Tony has said and, and we have heard today. What we are trying to do is to build that ecosystem and support the infrastructure for the West Midlands, as Tony described. And the three important pillars for us are the concept of involving all stakeholders in the production of new innovations, so the concept of co-production of integrated solutions. As we said, we need to look at what is happening in other world and what will resolve some of our critical problems through interoperability integration. I think Tony put interoperability integration at the core of what we do. And of course, put it in the context of how our society works, supporting policy making, but also supporting change within the society, and be able to have this health improvement, not as simple targets, but real wide health improvement and of course wealth creation through the involvement of the different stakeholders in society. So I think with that note and with this kind of vision we have in the digital health and the HSM, I would like to thank you for attending the conference and uh, it was a great and enjoyable day for me and I hope it was for you.